The following program contains extremely coarse language. Tonight on Four Corners, as scrutiny intensifies and authorities close in, we take you inside the world of Cathy Jackson and Michael Lawler, the union official and the industrial tribunal vice president in a world of trouble. Michael and Cathy, this is Inspector Hoyer. He's also from the World Bottle of Fair Command. Mr Hoyer will go up to the shipping container where a search of the shipping container will start with another search team. It says police raids coincide with preparation for an ABC Four Corners program. Blah, blah, blah. The story of their troubled lives. Real sweetheart. Is it possible that perhaps you have lost perspective? You've been caught up in a conspiracy theory or created one in an attempt to cover up your own wrongdoing. That's bullshit. Kathy Jackson is the former union boss who went from the hero who blew the whistle on corruption to the pariah who herself illegally spent more than a million dollars of union funds to fuel a lavish lifestyle and is now the subject of a major police investigation. Jackson's partner, Michael Lawler, is the quasi-judicial officer ruling on major industrial disputes who is now facing allegations that he benefited from her illegal spending and rorted his sick leave while working on her courtroom defence. They have now given extraordinary access to reporter Caro Meldrum Hanna to give startling and at times bizarre accounts of how they came to be in the mess they're in accounts that raise new and serious questions about their conduct. Lawler has never spoken publicly before about their predicament. In candid moments, he reveals, amongst other things, that he secretly taped conversations with his boss, the President of the Fair Work Commission. Tonight, we take you into the eye of their storm. Hello, uh, my name's Michael Lawler. Uh, you don't normally hear from somebody like me. Uh, I hold a quasi-judicial office in an organisation called the Fair Work Commission. I am going to make some allegations that are properly described as sensational. This is the secret video diary of a desperate man. There are strong conventions against judges or quasi-judicial officers making public comment on matters of public controversy. I have been involved in matters of public controversy these last several years and I have refrained from making public comment but having weighed the matter carefully I can see that it is my duty to make this statement. Michael Lawler is Vice President of the Fair Work Commission, the tribunal responsible for industrial relations and workplace rights across Australia. He holds one of the most powerful offices in the land. He's also a man under enormous pressure. Everybody's got a breaking point and I've certainly been close to mine. It took quite a long time to get there, but um, I've certainly been close to mine. Michael Lawler's troubles began eight years ago when he met and fell in love with the woman who's ended up almost destroying them both. In 2008, a significant accident occurred in my life. And by accident, I don't mean a mistake. By accident, I mean something coincidental. I met and formed a relationship with Catherine Jackson, the National Secretary of the Health Services Union. Do you think that your love for Cathy will ultimately be your downfall? Um, I'm not very good at predicting the future. And if it is, so be it. Um, the real question is whether or not my love for Cathy has clouded my judgement about the facts... Has it? ..and about the evidence. And I don't believe that it has. Well, do you feel responsible for dragging Michael into this? Of course I do. Sometimes I wish he just would have run and not at all got involved. And it would have been so far easier if they just killed me early on, destroyed me early on. 
anyone in our organisation who misuses union money, be it for you know, prostitution services or other unauthorised services, has committed a crime. Our first priority is to the members of the Health Services Union, not to members of the Australian Labor Party. As far as falls from grace go, the demise of Cathy Jackson, the former National Secretary of the Health Services Union, has been nothing short of spectacular. She was the courageous whistleblower taking on union corruption, the coalition's pin-up girl. Mr Speaker, uh, Cathy Jackson is a brave, decent woman and she's speaking up on behalf Order. of 70,000 members. Cathy Jackson is a revolutionary, Madam Speaker, and Cathy Jackson will be remembered as a lion of the union movement. Sure, Adam, you've done nothing wrong. No, I've got nothing to hide. You've completely f***ed us over while we think you should f*** off too. But in a remarkable twist, Australia was told the whistleblower was actually the biggest fraudster of all. You're married to Jeff Jackson. Not married to Jeff Jackson. You have issues with answering questions from the Royal Commission? Of course I don't. Whose money was it? Whose money? Could you tell us whose money it was? Disgraced former union leader Cathy Jackson has been ordered to pay $1.4 million for misusing union funds. In this courtroom, in a civil case brought against her by the union she used to rule, Cathy Jackson was found to have illegally spent $1.4 million of her members' money. The judge said she'd shown a pervasive sense of entitlement years of secret, lavish spending. Over how long, how many years, did Cathy Jackson misappropriate union money? That we're aware of, because we had to reconstruct the records to be able to establish the evidence. The evidence is documentary evidence. Um, it was a period of about uh, seven or eight years. The court heard evidence of hundreds of items and activities Cathy Jackson paid for using a secret account and her work credit cards. From paying off her mortgage to fine dining at the best restaurants, car expenses, cameras, food and liquor, department store purchases, baby accessories, luxury brand shopping, even artworks. She still denies it. Did you, Cathy Jackson, take $1.4 million dollars from the HSU? No, I did not take anything like that or anything from the HSU ever, ever. that I wasn't entitled to. And I do want to qualify it like that because they'll come out and say, yes, but you spent this money on travel. Yes, I did. I was entitled to that. This is the San Antonio Apartments in Santorini. That's the front door. Pretty spectacular view. Oh, my sweetheart. And then there's the travel. 34 trips, $175,000 over eight years. We're at Victory Circus. And there's Eros. What do you got to say for yourself, sweetheart? In these never before seen home videos, Michael Lawler and Kathy Jackson traverse Europe in August and September 2010. Hi, sweetheart. How are you? We're at Covent Garden. Street parties in England ancient ruins in Greece, road tripping in America. Oh, it's Enemy National Park in the south... Southeast corner of California. No, the southwest corner of the park. That's me. Life on the Union Dime was very good. It turns out that I have been the beneficiary of um, airfares and a small amount of accommodation that was paid for by the union. I didn't know that at the time. But when you go away on a trip together, you discuss who's paying for what. How didn't you know? Well, I did pay for parts of it. If I thought that I was actually the recipient of stolen money, I'd be wanting to repay it myself. But I don't believe that I am. Your so-called entitlements seem, at the very least, extraordinary and lavish. How much travel were you entitled to every year when you were with the union? Oh, up to about uh, $28,000 worth of travel. So that's in writing, travel entitlements of $28,000 in writing. 
Yes. And they have that. But the writings, well, they have it, but it's gone. It's not in the public domain. All the minutes, all bar eight sets of minute meeting minutes are missing. Cathy Jackson claims the evidence that could have proved her innocence, minutes of meetings, have disappeared or been destroyed. The court rejected her claim. Michael Lawler and Cathy Jackson have retreated to the New South Wales South Coast. It takes courage or madness to let a film crew into your life when your world is collapsing around you. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Michael. Going? Good to see you. How Welcome. are you? Come in. Thank you. So oh. Kathy's home today? She is. OK. If I actually can ask you something first off, yep. you have never spoken publicly, you have never entered into any sort of media coverage on, on all of this. Why have you decided to take a different turn and speak? I feel that my duty is to speak rather than remain silent. I would rather have no involvement in any of this. I've been sucked into the political world on account of being Cathy Jackson's partner, and that's an accident of history. Cathy Jackson is home on day release from a private mental health facility. She's there voluntarily. She's been in treatment for eight weeks. Some days I get so low that I just don't want to keep going anymore. Um, I see the effect it has on my children. I see the effect that it's had on my parents, on Michael. And I just don't feel I can go on some days. Diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, acute anxiety and depression, she's also come close to suicide. So why did Jackson blow the whistle if she is corrupt herself? She blew the whistle because I urged her and encouraged her to do so and reminded her that it was her duty to do so. And really, um, this for her is a case of redemption. But for Michael, Lola, who is right across there, would you have stayed silent? I probably would have resigned and not stayed there. What is the importance of your love, Michael Lawler, to this whole story, to this whole saga? Everything. Everything. I don't want to um, ever jeopardise my relationship with Michael, and I knew that um, if I was to do what they wanted me to do, that it would. And I just couldn't do it. Cathy Jackson's successor, HSU National Secretary Chris Brown suggests a very different motivation. Why would Cathy Jackson blow the whistle if she herself was a fraudster? Cathy Jackson was of the view that if she blew the whistle and was seen to be the person uh, cleaning up the union, then any wrongdoings that she had done would be overlooked and exonerated. She whether it was right or wrong, was of the view that if she blew the whistle at the Royal Commission, the Re Royal Commission wouldn't examine her wrongdoings. And so I think that that was the reason why she blew the whistle. Do you think I'm stupid enough to go to the police and make all these allegations and do all this stuff if I'd been like them? I don't think so. Cathy Jackson says she had certain terms and conditions, spending entitlements, as part of her employment at the HSU. The court believed otherwise. Yeah, the federal the court, court has ruled against you, accusing you of a $1.4 million fraud. Yeah, the federal court who didn't have my evidence, they just worked on or went off their evidence. That's a really fair federal court, isn't it? Yeah, the documentary evidence that we were able to put together... Chris uh, Brown is the man who led the union's charge against her. So there's a lot of items that we still think were probably questionable that we didn't include in our statement of claim and uh, we gave her the benefit of the doubt. 
Um, no doubt we anticipated that if she had evidence to the contrary, like she could have put uh, any of those uh, people on the stand to give that evidence, she would have done so. For eight years, Cathy Jackson wasn't cautioned or disciplined about her spending habits at the HSU. Her credit card bills were paid without question, month after month, year after year, by a small group of people, the union's branch committee. Ultimately, it's the branch committee of management's responsibility, but Jackson, as the senior officer, uh, has um, certain obligations under the Act, um, and they include ob obligations to take um, you know, care and due diligence in the, uh, the expenditure of funds to okay, not... OK, rewind. You've just said the ultimate responsibility lies with the branch committee. That's right. We've questioned some of them, okay. um, but some of them have refused to talk to us. The only people that could have known at the time were the branch committee of management. Yes. Now, for whatever reason, uh, they either didn't ask for the information, they weren't provided with the information, or they were misled. Well, what, were they incompetent or neglectful in their duty? Look, I think at the time, um, and, you know, the union largely, and probably not only the HSU but other unions as well at the time, probably did not have proper governance procedures or didn't have proper governance procedures in place. And what that rather suggests is the hung parliament voting situation. Last year, the on the 24th of July 2014, Michael Lawler began recording this video diary in an effort to clear his name and save his lover. I've got a lot of ground to cover. And I do want to talk to ordinary Australians. Content for the rules is a matter for the organisation itself. We're on the plane. In a five-hour monologue, Michael Lawler claims that he and his partner, Cathy Jackson, are the victims of a sophisticated, complex conspiracy against them, beginning in 2012. Led by individuals high up in the ALP, working in concert with corrupt union officials to smear them both, ruin their credibility and destroy them completely. Uh, in that... He calls it the machine. It is a thing that is concerned with the way in which power is acquired and maintained within unions and acquired and maintained within the ALP. It is a thing that is concerned with the relationship between the unions and the ALP and the manner in which the factional system in the ALP operates. Why is no one listening to your conspiracy theory? Because nobody's read the material or they're too scared. And, more importantly, they've, um, they've jumped at the tune of the media. The media runs a story about Cathy Jackson. The Royal Commission then investigate. You're not delusional? Definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I come to work with a sense of dread about the snake pit that I'm about to enter and I'd happily give up the office and the view and a lot more besides um, for all of this crap not to have happened. Michael Lawler was appointed Vice President of the Industrial Relations Commission in 2002. At the time, he was a successful barrister, hand-picked by the then Workplace Relations Minister, Tony Abbott, pictured here at Lawler's swearing-in ceremony. Darling. That's what you said earlier. Sorry. Wasn't it like get the fuck off or something like that? I did not say that to you <laughs> this morning. Other mornings, yes. Michael Lawler first met Cathy Jackson in 2006. Pictured here at the annual HSU ball in Sydney, before Jackson blew the whistle on union boss Michael Williamson when Bill Shorten was still her friend. At the time, both Lawler and Jackson were married with children. I love that girl. <laughs> I 
In March 2008, Kathy Jackson says they began a romantic relationship. It was a highly controversial union. The vice president of the Fair Work Commission in bed with the head of the union he was meant to independently adjudicate for or against in massive industrial disputes. Did you reach out to him or did he reach out to you? No, I reached out to him. Um, and that was um, during the conciliation, but like mid... In my mind, it's probably about March, because I left, I'd left my husband by that point. But in March, April, May of 2008, um, we're in regular contact in relation to the um, conciliation. And then in about July, August of 2008... Um, Can I interrupt here? Because you don't, just as a matter of fact, you just got that wrong as a matter of historical no, I have. fact. At this point in my interview with Cathy Jackson, Michael Lawler interrupts. The conciliation occurred in 2007 and I had a professional relationship with you as a party. And then the conciliation finished. And then in early 2008, you separated from Jeff and we had... Had the conciliation finished then? The conciliation had finished. But this is a matter of historical record. You can go the timing of the start of their romantic relationship is dangerous territory for Michael Lawler, a glaring conflict of interest. One he kept secret for five months and crucially, after he'd mediated on at least one private conciliation involving his lover, a bitter dispute between the HSU, the government and various health sector employers. It's been reported that you favoured the union over the employers or, say, government representatives in this private conciliation. That's a lie. Are there any other private conciliations that you sat in on or oversaw involving Cathy Jackson, your, your lover, That's, during this time before you were removed as panel head? the only matter that I was involved in that involved her or her union. So Michael Lawler never gave you any favourable treatment before he declared that conflict of interest? Definitely not. Otherwise, we would have got an outcome, and a favourable outcome, which we didn't. <laughs> we got an awful outcome. Seven years later, Michael Lawler's personal life with Cathy Jackson has put his job at the Fair Work Commission in jeopardy. It says I'm embroiled in a sick leave controversy, but that's a confected controversy. It makes me mad. Today, his conduct is front page news again, accused of falsifying nine months sick leave in order to work on Cathy Jackson's case, all the while enjoying a taxpayer funded salary of almost half a million dollars more than a federal court judge. How sick were you if you were able to help Cathy in her very complicated legal proceedings? I'd like very much if you could uh, ask my psychiatrist to explain that to you rather than have me do it. Michael Lawler gave us his confidential psychiatric report dated July 2015. It says, He's been diagnosed with a major depressive disorder that he definitely needed this time off work. There is absolutely nothing wrong with taking leave to help your partner defend herself against unjust attacks. In fact, I would have thought most Australians would regard that as an honourable and decent thing to do. When Cathy Jackson was first accused of being a fraudster in 2012, behind the scenes, Michael Lawler made an extraordinary decision. He began recording private phone conversations with his boss, the president of the Fair Work Commission, Justice Ian Ross, without his knowledge. During some conversations, Michael Lawler and Ian Ross discuss Cathy Jackson's case. How's Cathy bearing up with you? Because I think you've got the federal court thing. No, not very well. Oh, it's just, it's a, it's a nightmare, and it's just an absolute bloody nightmare. Michael Lawler now has around 60 audio files, hours of top secret recordings. He claims they contain the evidence that will clear him of allegations of misconduct. Right now. One moment. Hey, Michael. Oh, good day, Ian. How are you going? In this recording, Michael Lawler and President Ian Ross discuss Lawler's extended sick leave. Lawler says that in this conversation, Ian Ross tells him there's no cap to his sick leave entitlements. I think um, your health is the first priority. 
Yeah. Uh, and there's no, um, I mean, I'll um, uh, take responsibility for any amounts of sick leave you, you seek. There's no yeah. cap or anything like that. Oh, no, no, I understand there's no cap on it. I'll take responsibility for any amounts of sick leave. I know there's no cap on it. And then he writes to me denying he said anything to that effect. Michael Lawler gave us a copy of that letter, written by Justice Ian Ross three months after this phone conversation. In it, Justice Ross writes... I reject the suggestion that I made any statement to you to the effect that you had unlimited entitlement to sick leave. So let me explain how the recordings are made. Later, Michael Lawler shows me how he makes his covert recordings. Uh, if one holds the recorder close to the earpiece on the phone but not touching, and then you lift it all and hold it to your ear... Secretly recording phone conversations is generally illegal. Michael Lawler says he has a defence. He did it for the protection of his own legal interests. Alternatively, you can hold the recorder with your fingers. How do you think Ian Ross will react when he discovers that you have made those recordings? I imagine he'll be uh, uh, very annoyed indeed. Michael Lawler isn't just fighting to keep his job, he's fighting for his partner, Cathy Jackson. What's been done to my beloved is just evil. She's a thoroughly decent, kind, generous person. She has been totally destroyed. Her career has been destroyed. She has no income. She has no prospect of getting a job or income. She's suffering from a very deep depression. Um, and uh, there's no colour in her life. Bit of, bit of pressure on us now. <laughs> Jackson and Lawler have a visitor. Hello, how is the little dog? Here? The source of enormous controversy for the couple. Children He's 83 years old and suffering from advanced dementia. This is uh, Jackson. Jackson. And are there any other witnesses? And that's what's happening this afternoon. I went up there. On this Thursday. is David Roth. Eminent Sydney barrister and Queen's counsel, Michael Lawler's old colleague and mentor, Cathy Jackson's advisor in 2012. Now Michael Lawler and Cathy Jackson stand publicly accused of trying to pocket part of the ailing barrister's $30 million estate. Both yourself and Cathy have been portrayed to, to Australia as money-grabbing, as taking advantage and exploiting... It's false. He's my friend and my mentor. I love him. I promised that I would help him. I've been trying to honour that promise, but I don't want to harm him. Michael Lawler was appointed David Rofe's power of attorney in June 2013. Eight months later, Cathy Jackson was written in to David Rofe's will as a 10% beneficiary of his $30 million estate. Michael Lawler gave us a text message that he says was written by David Rose's primary carer and sent to Lawler two weeks before Cathy Jackson was written in to the will. According to the message, Jackson was written in at Rose's request. Many, many months ago, David expressed to me that he wanted to include a special lady, Cathy, into his will. Cathy has been the greatest help to David. A few nights ago, David said quite clearly to me, he wants Cathy in there, one-tenth. The controversy surrounding Lawler and Jackson's relationship with David Rofe yep. doesn't end with the old man's will. But he asked uh, Premier In June 2014, using power of attorney and $1.35 million of David Rofe's money, Michael Lawler purchased this four-bedroom home where we're standing now. It's conveniently located just across the road from Lawler and Jackson's house. I'd like to think it was a selfless act doing it because when you're living close to somebody with dementia, the demands on your time are increased significantly. Michael Lawler put the house in David Rofe's name. Do you want David Rofe's money? No. 
not only do I not want David Rove's money, on at least a dozen occasions I've asked, asked him to promise me that he won't give me any of his money. And I can produce recordings of that. I don't want and have no interest in your money, and neither does Kathy. Well, I know... I'm... Michael Lawler gave us dozens of recordings. For legal reasons, we can't play many of them. They include discussions involving several people connected to David Rove's finances. On the eve of the Wambara property auction, Michael Lawler rang David Rove. David, I need to say something to you, and you need to listen to this. Take some money out of our account today. Yes. Well, uh, how much did you take? One hundred and sixty. One hundred and sixty. One hundred and sixty thousand dollars has been taken. You and the reason why it's happening. From me I, I know I don't. House. I know I don't. I know. I know you've said not to. And you are now doing something that has absolutely no authority or backing by me. I've talked to you about this a lot. You have not talked to me about it a lot. No, I just... You... I've never been in favour of it. I told you that yeah. I did not want... Let's, let me explain to you, David, please. ...isolated by you people. No, please let me... Please let me say something. Please, you've done a lot of speaking. Now listen for a moment. It is not your fault that you have dementia. The next day, Michael Lawler purchased the Wambara property at auction. Within hours, David Rofe revoked Lawler's power of attorney in this handwritten letter. 24 hours later, Michael Lawler rang David Rofe to try and change his mind. You are going to look like a complete fucking idiot. And I don't want that to happen to my friend. You've got to stop this, David. You're being stupid. It is a disgrace for you to ring me up after well, what you, you, has happened in the last few days. Listen, David, I what told you, you I told you repeatedly... David, what do you want? I told you repeatedly that I, I was going to purchase going to that property for you... Responsibility ...because... Uh, had agreed. Oh, you poor little darling. I'm yeah, I'm a poor little darling. What sort of things are you causing other people? Oh, God. You don't None want to, of the people you... You don't know about the rest of my life, for Pete's sake. Anything. The great HSU saga. You, there's something medically wrong with you, and I honestly suggest you try and find out what it is. Why did you make those recordings? It's a peculiar thing to do. Um, from a time in early 2012, I began to understand that I was exposed to being attacked around actions that I'd taken and that it would come down to contests between who said what to whom. Michael Lawler and David Rofe have patched up their differences. Rofe still owns this house. Jackson and Lawler recently rented it for themselves to live in. They plan to care for David Rofe here permanently. That afternoon, inside Rofe's kitchen, Jackson prepares lunch. I'm worried about Cathy. I'm worried about Cathy. Well, she's in a very worrying position. There's no doubt about that. Yes. It's looking grim at the moment, but as I keep on saying to you, the thing that she's missed most is having somebody of your competence appearing for her. David Rofe isn't just here for lunch. He's running his eye over Cathy Jackson's appeal. Did David have any suggestions on the notice of appeal? I wouldn't. Well, it's a really a holding position because the appeal period runs out today. Yeah, well, there you are, so... I just don't feel justice has been done. And there is a vendetta against me, and I'm not sounding crazy when I say that, but um, I'm going to put, put an appeal in because I never got a fair hearing. I knew I'd never give up. Mm. And um, I'm not going to let these bastards drag me down for their own political purposes. If you need to, I don't know, do you, you have need got to, to do go. something? Yeah, I've got to go. 
Kathy Jackson's appeal period expires today. If she doesn't get to the federal court in the next hour, her hopes of appealing and overturning the judgment against her will be dashed for good. She makes it just in time. Yeah, it's done. You're sticking your hand in the lion's jaws. It's been there from the beginning, hasn't it? <laughs> Nothing else to lose. I've been wondering, um, are you brave or are you mad? I'm angry. There's a difference. It's great to have you home, darling. It's only day one. Don't get too excited. Don't get too excited. Love you so much. Later that week, there's more bad news for Jackson and Lawler. The ALP has written to the coalition, asking Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull to urgently address Michael Lawler's conduct at the Fair Work Commission. O'Connor's written to Turnbull, suggesting a bipartisan approach to removing me. For what? Oh, for misconduct and or incapacity. Incapacity? Yeah. Incapacity. It's an unprecedented move. And for Michael Lawler to be removed from office because he's done the right thing and supported me, then there's something wrong with this country. Something seriously wrong with our political system and the judicial system. I believe that on account of the assiduous study that I've done over these last four years, I've come to an understanding of how the machine operates, what its standard operating procedures are, how they do their business. And I have predicted precisely this type of attack. Mr Lawler's conduct over the last five years can only be described as extraordinary. Taking extreme amounts of leave at the expense of the taxpayer nine out of the last 12 months. Political conviction. That afternoon in Parliament, the stakes are raised even higher. ALP Senator Stephen Conroy, Cathy's old union friend, is launching a blistering attack. In his greed, he received ownership of a property purchased with the proceeds of crime. The money trail leads straight from the HSU to Jackson's Melbourne Mortgage, then on to financing with a Wombra Mortgage the home that Mr Lawler now includes as one of his own assets. Lawler is living off the proceeds of crime. Oh, my God. If it weren't so serious, it would be very funny. To protect the integrity... Destroy, 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 Michael. You know that. That's what they do. This is the way they operate. Michael. There is a, a very real question, though, to be answered. And that is, Michael, whether you have benefited from the proceeds of crime, a fraud of the HSU. Yeah. Have you? Um, I have not knowingly benefited from the proceeds of crime. And when it's tested in a criminal court, we'll find out. Later, Michael Lawler makes a significant admission about Jackson's activities at the HSU. There are a number of transactions that have been discovered um, that are prima facie crooked and that need an explanation. The crooked transactions involve a money transfer made by Cathy Jackson into the joint mortgage account she had with her ex-husband, Jeff Jackson, in 2009, when fraudster Michael Williamson was still running the HSU. The ALP claims that money has flowed in to Jackson and Lawler's Wombara home. The last time I did a count, it was in the order of $50,000, and they are the transactions that represent the payment of monies from the NHDA, the slush fund of the number three branch, uh, into the uh, Jeff Jackson account or their joint mortgage account. And um, I know what her explanation for those transactions is. It's not a very palatable explanation, but it's an explanation nonetheless. And it'll be given at some point. Cathy, what's the explanation? Well, the explanation is that it was an arrangement that was put in place by Michael Williamson and um, 
Jeff in relation to work that Jeff did for the number one branch, oh, for the um, New South Wales branch. Did you know at that time that you were making a payment that was probably improper? No. No. With a bit of hindsight, yes. But every time a payment was made, I spoke to the bookkeeper and told her that, you know, this is, this is what the payment was for. And it was written up in the accounts in such a fashion as well. At home with Michael Lawler and Kathy Jackson, the mood is tense. A criminal investigation into their finances is gathering pace. Oh, I just can't believe that it's just ended up like this. Like all these people that we've been talking about, they're all quite real. And I was friends with all of them. I'll be characterised as that scumbag, crook, fraudster, and at the very best, somebody who's been bewitched by an evil harridan, namely Cathy, that I'm cunt-struck and that I have been utterly um, taken in by somebody who's a serious crook. Have you been? No. No. Lawler and Jackson still claim they have the evidence that backs up their conspiracy theory. Time's running out for them to prove it. Is it possible that perhaps you have lost perspective? You've been caught up in a conspiracy theory or created one in an attempt to cover up your own wrongdoing. That's bullshit. Twelve days ago, Victoria and New South Wales Police and the AFP, Joint Task Force Heracles, raided Jackson and Lawler's Wombara home. Mr. Oyer will go up to the shipping container where a search of the shipping container will start with another search team. The police spent 10 hours searching their home for evidence, removing hard drives, boxes of documents, artworks, investigating whether Jackson and Lawler have benefited from misappropriated union funds. And then in here it says, police raids coincide with preparation of an ABC Four Corners program, blah, blah, blah the story of their troubled lives. A range of formidable forces now confront Cathy Jackson and Michael Lawler. Unionists, the government, the judiciary and the police. But Jackson is sticking to her story. They might think I'm just this harping harpy that's just gonna carry on, and I will, until the truth is out about what actually happened at the Health Services Union. There was a protection racket in there, it's still there, and those bastards are still running the show. Anyway, I sound like a crazy conspiracy theorist when I say that, but I'm not. <laughs> Outside, Michael Lawler is mulling over their future. I, mean, I know enough about the way this process works. But darling, you've got a trike force here at police investigating anything. You need to be very careful. Now, is there anything you need to worry about? Is the, you know, summarising the way it's put. No, there's nothing I need to worry about. Well, it remains to be seen whether she's right about that or not. If it turns out that she's committed offences, well then, so be it. The consequences will be what they are. It will now be interesting to see how the Fair Work Commission reacts to Michael Lawler's revelations tonight and to see what the police investigation finds. We approached a number of other people relevant to this story, including the Minister for Industrial Relations, Michaelia Cash, Opposition Leader Bill Shorten, Senator Stephen Conroy, Fair Work Commission President Ian Ross and people connected to David Rothe, but they declined to be interviewed. That's the program for tonight. Until next Monday, good night.